This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. Alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa nasta'adih. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu fa huwa al-muhtadih. ومن يضلل الله فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له في علاه ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله الذي اصطفاه صلى الله وسلم عليه وزاده فضلا وشرفا لديه وصلى على الآل والأصحاب والتابعين لهم بإحسان وبعد فقد قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لسيدنا علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله عنه إن فيك مثلا من عيسى بن مريم أبغضته اليهود حتى بهتوا أمه وأحبته النصارى حتى أنزلوه بالمنزلة التي ليس به ثم قال علي يهلك في رجلان محب مفرط يقرضني بما ليس في ومضغط يحمله شنآني على أن يمهتني صدق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وصدق علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله عنه وأرضاه For many centuries the interaction between Shia and Ahl Sunnah was characterized by a recognition of the fact and admission of the fact that there are differences. Whether one elevates those differences to the level of essentials of deen or whether one regards them as thing, things that are secondary as far as our aqeedah and our sharia ah are concerned the fact is that there has always been recognition of the fact that there are differences. It would only be in this belated century that the slogan would be raised that there are no differences between the Shia and the Ahlul Sunnah. Why would it be in this belated century and only now that the slogan would be raised that says لا شيعي ولا سني وكلنا إخوان. Why is it only now that we start saying that there is no such a thing as a Shi'i, no such a thing as a Sunni? We are all brothers. We are all Muslims. There could be several reasons for this. One could be the realization on the part of Muslims themselves that we are faced with a common enemy. In the face of a common enemy, it makes sense to make common cause, to stand together. It could also be the need for the Shi'i proselytizer, propagator, to tell his Sunni audience that we are, have no real differences between ourselves and use that as a springboard and as an entrance to the hearts and the minds of the Ahlul Sunnah thereby to convert them. Both these could be possible reasons. Which one of the two is it? Before, whenever it happened that the Muslim world was faced by a common enemy, resistance would be offered by the powers that be. And the powers that be in all the past centuries has always been, they have always been the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Back when the Crusaders threatened the Muslim world, it was Sultan Nuruddin Zangi, before him his father Imaduddin Zangi, who offered resistance. At that time, the Muslim world was divided into several different portions. In Egypt there was the Fatimid Empire, a Shi'i Empire that was ruling at the time. In Syria and Iraq there were the various Sunni kingdoms united under the Khilafah in Baghdad. When it came to resisting the Crusaders, it was these Sunni 
powers that offered resistance. When they got wind of the fact that the Shia might be attempting to form an alliance with the Shia, the Crusaders might be attempting to form an alliance with the Shia against them, Nuruddin sent Salahuddin to Egypt. And he told him to take over Egypt in order to, 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 to create a united front against the enemy, that's the Crusaders. Salahuddin came to Egypt, Egypt was soon taken over, the Fatimid Empire came to an end, they fled from Egypt, Egypt became part and parcel of the world of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah once again, and resistance could be offered. So if you look at that time, was there any need for saying, La Shi'i wa La Sunni? There was no need. The rulers, the powers that be at that time offered resistance from the united platform of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. When the Tatars came, the Mongols came, once again it was the rulers of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah who offered resistance and eventually turned the tide at Ain Jalut when they were beaten by Qutuz and Baybars. So in all instances in the past when we had a united enemy fighting us, resistance used to come from within the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. It was only in this belated century, oh, before we come to our belated century, these powers were then succeeded by the new power which arose from about the 10th century onwards, those were the Ottoman Turks. The Ottoman Turks had to fight on two fronts. The Ottoman Turks on the one hand were penetrating into Eastern Europe. Islam was spreading. 1453, Constantinople fell to Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, one of the greatest victories that Muslims had ever won. Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih enters Constantinople as, as the victor. From there onwards, expedition after expedition enters Eastern Europe. All of Greece is taken, Bulgaria, Austria, many of these parts once upon a time were part of the Ottoman Empire. While they were fighting the Ottoman Empire on the one side, they found that they were being attacked from the rear. While they were facing the Ottomans on the one side, they found that they were being attacked from the rear, from behind. Who was attacking them from behind? Iran had recently, Persia, the land today known as Iran, had recently been conquered by the Safavids. The Safavid Empire was that particular dynasty that turned Iran into a, into a Shi'i land. It was not a Shi'i land before that. They enforced belief in Shi'ism on all the people sent the ulama into exile and exterminated many of them as we have mentioned before. And Shah Ismail Safawi, the first Shi'i ruler of Iran, sent a letter to the, to the emperor uh, of Austria at the time, telling him that it is my wish that every masjid in the Ottoman territories must be turned into a church. You attack them from the one side, we will attack them from the other side. Christians from the one side, the Shia from the other side, and in the Spinza movement we will trap the Ottomans and destroy them. At that moment in time what we are trying to point out here is, no one was calling for Sunni Shia unity. Resistance against the powers of the West was being offered by the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The Shia, if they were anywhere, they were on the side of the enemy in this particular one. Then 1924, the Ottoman Khilafah comes to an end. The 20th century is ushered in with all the various changes that it brought. We already passed the century, we into the 21st century, but if we go back to the last decades of the 20th century, we find that now Iran undergoes a major transformation. Undergoes a transformation, a metamorphosis, it changes from the Pahlavi Empire, it changes into the Islamic Revolution of Imam Khomeini. From this moment, the call for unity is repeated incessantly without end. Everyone is saying, Shi'i, Sunni, this is not needed today. These are not debates that we need to go back to today. The Muslim world requires a united front. This is a noble sentiment. This is a noble sentiment, it's something to be praised to the extent that it requires, that it deserves praise. The Muslim world requires a united front against huge powers. It was the age of the two great superpowers. On the one side, America and its Western allies. On the other side, Russia and its communist allies. And the world of Islam caught in the middle. With who do you side? Do you go with the one side or do you go with the other side? With the capitalists or the communists? 
At that time for someone to come forward and say Let's forget about Shi'i and Sunni Let's look at a united front That is the most noble sentiment The praiseworthy sentiment But to go to the extent and say That there are no differences Between the Shia and Ahlul Sunnah Is to be naive There are differences A thousand years and more One and a half millenniums of differences cannot be wished away in the blink of an eye there are differences what we can say however that it is possible for us to shelve those differences it is possible for us to shelve not to ignore the existence of those differences but to shelve them in order to achieve some more immediate purpose but to ever imagine that there are no differences between the two that's going to be naive for both sides you cannot wish reality away in the time that these slogans have been raised several things have been taking place together with it and it is not so much the call for unity that makes us worry it is what has accompanied this call for unity and that is the expansionist activities of the Shia three decades have told us now that is not just a matter of ignoring certain differences it is a matter of cap of, cap, uh, of cashing in it's a matter of taking advantage of ignorance and of naivety on the part of the Ahlul Sunnah in order to spread thereby the ideas of the Shia if it was that the Shia had come to us and say look we know we have our differences let's forget them for now let's put them aside for now and let's work together and neither will we encroach upon your territory and you should, should not encroach upon our territory I think that's something to go for but three decades up to now have told us that this is not to be it's not going to be as simple as we have our ideas, you have your ideas, you keep yours to your territory, we keep ours to our territory, and we stand together. That unfortunately, three decades experience has shown us that it's not going to happen just as simple as that. It is for that reason that we get together here. It is for that reason that we find ourselves forced to delve back into the classical sources of Shiism in order that our people not be misled into thinking of Shiism as some innocuous, some innocent phenomenon between whom and ourselves there are no differences as such there are differences those differences depending on the level of seriousness and the level of commitment to Shiism in its classical guise that you have within the person depending upon that level those differences will be serious if the person's commitment to those differences are not that deep they will be less serious but we cannot just wish away reality those differences do exist and those differences, where do they originate from? We've come a long way. Since the days when we started talking about the concept of imama, since the days that we discussed the various ayat in the Qur'an, and we came to discover that there is absolutely nothing in the Qur'an, nothing in the book of Allah, that supports an idea of imama along the lines that the Shia believe in it. That is a difference, it's a major difference. If the Shia is prepared to admit that no, there is nothing in the Qur'an about imama, if he is prepared to admit that this matter is not religious, it's more political, if he is prepared to say all of these things and truly believe it, I think we've got some kind of foundation to work forward, to work together, to stand together we are not here simply to demonize the Shia and say they are so bad and that they are so bad but we have a right and we have a duty to know exactly what does classical Shiism teach and if any Shi'i today is prepared to come forward and say that look I abjure all of that I reject all of that that's in the books I have a new idea I'm a reformer Shi'i say marhaban ahlan wa sahlan you are a reformer Shi'i do you believe in this do you believe in that he says I don't believe in it I take him at his word but while I take him at his word last week was it last week I, I think of it as last week our last lesson we had an entire hour and a half if not more of discussing around the issue of taqiyya so while I take him at his word I keep in the back of my mind something else I just keep on my guard I just keep on my guard because I know I'm dealing with a people with whom taqiyya has always been an institution. It is possible that you can get a Shia today who is not making taqiyya. It is possible. But I have to be careful. So are we here to demonize the Shia? This is not about demonizing the Shia at all. This is about learning Shiism with its mask off. 
Shiism as it appears in their books. Shiism as they taught their people all these years before the need of forming this united front came about. So, we go back then. The difference is a difference in imama, but today we want to speak about something else. We want to speak about the personality of the one that was supposed to occupy that particular position of imama, Sayyiduna Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu arda. Now, before we get any further into the personality of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, I want to mention something and that is that the Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah find themselves in a bit, at a bit of a disadvantage. Once upon a time we learned something about the Shia and that is that the Shia have something called Al-Wala wal bara Love and hate. There is a love-hate relationship, not with the same persons. Shiism as it stands, it holds a certain attitude towards certain persons and the exact opposite of that attitude towards other persons. With regard to Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Ahlul Bayt, or rather certain figures from the Ahlul Bayt, it has a certain attitude. They love and respect, revere them, and they raise them to levels which they never claim for themselves either. By the same token, they conceive of the rest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and at the head of those Sahaba, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman radiallahu anhum, they conceive of these as the worst of people, for which reason they will hate them, detest them, curse them, abjure them say the worst of things about them, apply to them certain things uh, which do not apply to them at all, invent certain ahadith and incidents about them to make them out to be much worse uh, than uh, anything that they could ever have been. This is what Shiism is all about. There are two parties, Ahlul Bayt on the one hand, Sahaba radiallahu on, on the other. The, Ahlul, the, the Shia look at the one party and they love them to bits. They look at the other party and they hate them. They hate them to the depth of their hearts, from the depth of their hearts. We the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we have in front of us the same two parties. We also see in front of us the Ahlul Bayt, the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we see on the other hand, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. With which eye, with what kind of eye do we look at either party? When we look at the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, we say radiallahu anhum. When we look at the Ahlul Bayt, we say this is the beloved family of our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We love the one and we love the other. The Shia love the one and they hate the other. We the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah take into consideration, consideration something which our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us. He taught us balance, he taught us moderation. That same balance and moderation about which Allah Ta'ala tells us, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى we have been made this ummah of moderation. We don't love in excess. We don't hate in excess. But it was inevitable that it would happen in this ummah that there would be there would come about people that would love in excess and that would hate in excess. Therefore, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam once upon a time addressed Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu, and he told him, Ya Ali, the hadith contained in Musnad Imam Ahmad. يا علي إن فيك مثلا من عيسى بن مريم علي there is a similarity between yourself and سيدنا عيسى بن مريم what is that similarity excessive love and excessive hatred أبغضته اليهود حتى بهت أمه وأحبته النصارى حتى أنزلوه بالمنزلة التي ليس بها. The Yahud hated Isa ibn Maryam. They hated him. He was the Messiah that Allah Taala had sent to them. When he came and told them, "Inni Rasul Allah ilaykum and I'm the Messiah and I'm Allah's Rasul to you," they rejected him. Not only did they reject him, but their hatred of Sayyidina al-Masih Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam was such that they accused his mother of faithlessness. They accused his mother of having conceived of a child out of wedlock. On the other hand, we live in a society that is dominated by Christianity. A society in which Isa ibn Maryam has become Thalithu Thalatha. A society in which we speak about God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Ghost. A society in which Isa ibn Maryam has been raised to such levels which he had never claimed for himself, which doesn't belong to him. Where Allah Ta'ala had been taken off his throne and Isa had been put on that throne. Similar to Isa ibn Maryam, says Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, will you be our Ali? 
In this ummah there will be those people who will love you to such an extent that they will raise you to a level which you do not have. On the other hand there will be people who will hate you to such an extent that they will make certain allegations about you. So Ali ibn Abi Talib says after that, يَهْلِكُ فِيَّ رَجُلًا Two men, two types of men will come to destruction on account of me. On account of me, that means on account of their attitudes towards me. On the one hand there will be those who will love him muhibbun mufritun a person who loves him with excessive love muhibbun mufritun whose love will be such to such an extent yuqarridni bima laysa fiya who will ascribe to me such things which i do not possess who will say that this is the imam after rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam whose position is even higher than that of all the anbiya that particular person on account of whom adam was forgiven by allah when he invoked his name on account of whom isa was saved and musa was saved and everything else and all the anbiya became anbiya on account of the fact that they believed in ali ibn abi talib there will be those people in this ummah in fact there will also be those who will say that ali ibn abi talib forget being higher than the anbiya there will even be those of the most extreme sects of the shia who will claim that ali is allah that also has happened in history on the other hand ya ali rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there will be also that person who will hate you because of his hatred of you what will happen is that he will make allegations about you who are those is that the ahlu sunnah wal jamaa is there anyone sitting here who has any bit of negativity hate dislike of ali ibn abi talib in his heart to us ali ibn abi talib radiyallahu anhu is what he is the son in law of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he is amirul mu'minin he is the one whose name we mention in our khutbas. He is the one whom we name our children after. He is the one who saved Islam and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in so many battles. Nothing negative we have to say about Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. But you know what? That is not enough. For the Shia that is not enough. How much do you love Isa ibn Maryam? He is Allah's Rasul. He is that Nabi. But that is not enough for a Christian. He won't be happy. They won't be happy until you say along with him that yes, Isa is Ibn Allah. Isa is the son of Allah. And Isa is Allah. Similarly with the Shia, it is not enough to love Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. It's not enough to name our children after him. It's not enough to name his, uh, to, to, to mention his name in the khutbah. It is not enough to say radiallahu anhu after his name. It is not even enough to say alayhi salam after his name. What is enough? The only thing which is enough, if you are going to say that, he is who? He is Wasiyu Rasulillahi wa Khalifatuhu bila fasl. He is the Khalifa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without any interruption. And even then it is not enough. What you will have to say, it is implicit in the statement, but you will have to believe afterwards. If he is the one who is the appointed, the legacy, the successor of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it means that anyone who has taken his position is a kafir. Therefore, what is required from that side is not that we simply love and respect the Ahlul Bayt. We already do that. What is expected from that side is that we have to raise them to the exact same levels as the Shia raised them. Merely love and respect is not sufficient. In this regard, Aqeedah of the Shia. Aqeedah is basically four chapters. Four things that we speak about when we speak about Aqeedah. We speak about what? about everything connected to Allah we call that the ilahiyat and then we have an nubuwat issues connected to prophethood then we have the sam'iyat the unseen world that we hear from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and therefore we believe it we believe in malaika and we believe in hisab and we believe in adab of the qabr and we believe in all of that that we hear from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we believe in it and the last one is imama in that chapter of Imama, that's where all the differences with the Shia uh, come to be discussed. In that chapter, that is extremely important to the Shia because Imama is what they call the raison d'etre of Shiism. Imama is the reason why Shiism exists. There won't be any Shiism if there's no debate around Ali ibn Abi Talib. Anhu. 
But the debater on Ali ibn Abi Talib will inevitably touch upon certain other figures, meaning who? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and the rest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu by extension. Therefore, I want to introduce a concept here, and that concept is called manaqib and mathalib. Manaqib is where we speak about merits of particular persons. The manaqib of Abu Bakr, the manaqib of Ali, in other words, the virtues of those persons. What Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that is great about that particular person. As far as we the Ahlul Sunnah are concerned, we say that all of these Sahaba have their manaqib. All of these Sahaba have their virtues, their merits. But together with that, there goes something else, especially on the Shia side, there is something else, it's called the mathalib, the demerits. In other words, the bad things that they believe about certain persons. There is no manaqib alone, it has to be accompanied with mathalib. And any Shi'i writer, whether he comes from the 3rd, 4th, 5th, or the 20th, or our present century in which we are living today, any Shi'i writer who is going to write on these issues, it is inevitable that he will be touching on the manaqib and the mathalib. He will be speaking about the excellences, he will be speaking about the merits and the virtues of Amir Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu but no discussion around the manaqib of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu will ever be complete until it has been accompanied by what are supposed to be the vices of Abu Bakr, the evils of Umar and the evils of Uthman and the rest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu from the first to the last from Kulaini so many centuries ago to Khumaini in, in the century that has just passed us now each and every one of them, that is why Shiism exists that is why she is, if there was no debate around these things, there was no debate around Ali ibn Abi Talib and Imama, there wouldn't have been, then we could have 100% agreed with anyone who says that La Shi'i wa la Sunni, there's no such a thing as Shi'ism and there's no such a thing, there are no differences whatsoever. There are differences. And those differences are indeed very severe when it comes to certain things. It, it doesn't make sense to ignore these things. Be aware of them. And once you are aware of them, and you come face to face with a particular Shi'i person who professes not to believe in them, then there are two things which we can say to him. What am I speaking about? If you come face to face with a Shi'i who says, yes, I believe in the Fadail, I believe in the virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib, but I don't believe that Abu Bakr and Umar were evil persons. There are two things that we can say to this person. The first thing is that you are not a Shi'i. At least not as Shiism expressed itself in a thousand years of literature. Then you're not a Shi'i, you call yourself by some other name. But you definitely do not like Kulaini, you're not like Saduq, you're not like Sayyid Murtada, you are not like Al Allama Al Hilli, you are not like Mullah Baqir Majlisi, or you are not even like Khomeini for that matter. You are something else. Call yourself a, any other name. Call yourself a Bi'i or a Li'i, but don't call yourself a Shi'i. That's one thing that we can tell the person. We say, you don't believe in it, marhaban, ahlan, wa sahlan, change your name. Because, what if a person comes to you today, he says, you know what, I'm a Christian. What kind of Christian we ask him? He says, I'm a Roman Catholic. But you know what, I don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is a prophet sent by God, and God is a being completely separate. I say, are you really a Roman Catholic? Does Pope Benedict actually teach that? No, he doesn't teach that, but I'm different from him. So I say, call yourself something else, not a Roman Catholic. Call yourself some other name. But don't call yourself a Roman Catholic. So a Shia comes, he says, look, I believe that Ali ibn Abi Talib is the best amongst his Sahaba radiallahu anhum. I will tell him, you are different from us, the Ahlul Sunnah. We believe that Abu Bakr is the best. If you believe that Ali is the best, that doesn't make you a kafir. That doesn't make you a kafir, it makes you different from us the Ahlul Sunnah, but not to such an extent that we're going to reject you. We can still live along with that. But what do you say about the rest of the Sahaba? And then if he says, well, I love all the rest of the Sahaba, and they are good persons, then the one thing that we tell him, you're not a Shi'i. You're not an Ithna Ashari Shi'i. You may be some other kind of Shi'i, but not an Ithna Ashari. The second thing that we will tell him, and we might not feel like telling him this, but this will be sitting in the back of our minds is, Maybe you're making taqiyya, brother. There is perhaps a third thing that we can tell him also. You don't know enough about Shiism even to know what Shiism teaches. Any of those things could be said to that person. Call yourself something else, stop making taqiyya, or you are very, very ignorant. You don't know what Shiism teaches. On the manaqib of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, our airwaves have been filled in recent weeks with a lot of them. 
You would have heard some of them if you were at any of those particular gatherings. You would have heard them over the radio if you've been listening to some of them there. And what I want to mention about those particular manaqib and fadail of Ibn Abi Talib is the following. The bulk of them, if not all of them, would be what? Would it be ayat from the Quran or would it be a hadith? Most of the things that you would have heard would have been what? A hadith or ayat? As far as ayat from the Quran are concerned, there is not one ayah, not one single ayah in the Quran which can be taken in isolation on its own strength and connected to Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib alone in such a way which makes him preeminent amongst all the Sahaba and the only Khalifa and everyone else is evil. Allah's book is protected against any such interpolation. As far as hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu as far as hadith is concerned. I didn't say hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi I am correcting myself. As far as hadith is concerned, anyone can forge a hadith. I can sit here now and forge a hadith. I won't do it. Because the one who forges a hadith, he must go prepare his place in Jahannam. فَمَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقَعْدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ But it's within the ability of any person to forge a hadith. How do we know when the hadith is authentic and how do we know when the hadith is not authentic? The first and most important thing we need to do is to ascertain authenticity. Once we have ascertained the authenticity of a particular hadith, then we look at something else. Ascertain the correct meaning. Make sure what is the correct meaning, in what context was this said in order to understand what is meant by it. First and foremost we have to ask ourselves, is this authentic? Everyone jumps to authenticity when it comes to other things. When Salman Rushdie wrote his evil book called the Satanic Verses, he wasn't sucking anything out of his thumb, he didn't make up anything. He was going to the books of Tafsir and the books of Hadith. In there he found certain reports on which he based the story around which he eventually wrote his Satanic Verses. So we found in the books. But Khomeini was so incensed, so angered was he by it, that he tells Rushdi, I'm going to give a fatwa of death against you. Why? Because he has spoken a lie. What about the fact that Salman Rushdi used hadith to back himself up? That is a forgery. That is a forgery. It's a fraudulent report. Our ulama have been saying so for a thousand years and more. That's a fraudulent report. Khomeini was prepared to issue a fatwa of not only kufr, a fatwa of a death warrant against a person who was using a forged report and pointing a finger thereby to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The ahadith of the Shia, the most important hadith books of the Shia, you can barely find a hadith book of the Shia that doesn't contain reports about the Quran being changed. There are several reports just about any hadith book of the Shia. Ni'matullah al-Jazairi, the author of Al-Anwar al numaniya states in his book that there are something like 2,000 ahadith of the Shia that state that the Qur'an have been, has been changed. You ask the Shia about it today, they say, we don't believe in it. Why don't you believe in it? Some of the Shia believed it in the past. They say, because we looked at all those ahadith and we found that they are weak ahadith. They are not authentic. In other words, there is a certain methodology being applied. No one accepts hadith on face value. If a hadith comes and it clashes with something which is known to be part of our deen, it goes against certain very basic essentials of our deen, then we reject a hadith, a hadith such as that. We look at the authenticity of it, we look who are the people who know this hadith, and then we find here's a person who is not trustworthy, we cannot accept such a hadith. Hadith is not something which if anyone says, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then we must immediately accept, we must first ascertain authenticity. After having ascertained authenticity, we look thereafter at applicability. We look at the proper meaning, we look at the proper context. The context will tell us how to understand this particular hadith. So there are many many ahadith. So many ahadith that it will take us several sessions just to work through all of them. Those interested can go and look at the books on Mawdu'at, the Mawdu'at of Ibn al-Jawzi and the La'ali al-Masnu'a of Suyuti and Tanzih al-Sharia of Ibn Harraq look at all of these places to see the amount of hadith that had been forged in the past about the various khulafa radiyallahu anhum we've heard several of them one of the most famous ones among them is the hadith which states ana madinatul ilmi wa aliyun babuha 
I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its gate. Does this appear as a hadith? Does it appear? Yes, it does appear as a hadith. Is it an authentic hadith, however? After inspecting this particular hadith, the ulama of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah come to the conclusion that this is not an authentic hadith. Now, there are two approaches. The one approach is when a hadith suits you, it's authentic, and when it doesn't suit you, it's not authentic. The other approach is look at what you have in front of you, look at the chain of narration, look at the persons who are narrating the hadith, and then whether hadith agrees with you or it doesn't agree with you, if it doesn't satisfy the criteria of authenticity, then it is not authentic. This particular hadith doesn't satisfy the criteria of authenticity, it is not authentic. There is another version of it. There are several versions of this particular hadith. There is another version of it. To demonstrate to you that we the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah don't accept the hadith simply because it suits us. Read you another version of that same hadith. Ana Madinatul Ilm Wa Abu Bakrin Asasuha Wa Umar Hitanuha Wa Uthmanu Saqfuha Wa Aliyun Babuha I am the city of knowledge. Abu Bakr is its foundation. Umar is its walls, Uthman is its roof, and Ali is its door. That hadith also is not authentic. It suits us fine, but it's not authentic, it doesn't satisfy the criteria of authenticity. We reject this hadith is unauthentic, we reject that hadith is unauthentic. Authenticity is a matter of objective assessment, is not what I like and what you like. There are hadith on the khabail of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, إن الله يتجلى يوم القيامة للناس خاصة وللناس عام وليبي بكر خاصة On a day of Qiyamah Allah will appear to all people in general but specifically to Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه That is also a موضوع That's also a forgery Not because it is about Abu Bakr but because who is narrating it? A known liar is narrating it So when a known liar tells me something which suits me fine it's still a lie it doesn't stop the fact that it is a lie. Our friends from the other side of the camp, or the other side of the divide, they look at the hadith, Ana Madinatul Ilmi wa Aliyun Babu Hadi. Hold on to it. This is the hadith. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a city of knowledge, Ali is the doorway of knowledge, no one can come to the city except through this doorway. So for 23 years, tell me what was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doing, and who was he teaching, and what was he teaching them. Why would he tell us in certain case, cases that if you want to learn the Quran, you go and learn it from who? From Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Why would he tell us this ummah that Aqra'ukum Ubayy ibn Ka'ab? The most learned qari of the Quran is who? Ubayy ibn Ka'ab. وَأَعْلَمُكُمْ بِالْحَلَالِ وَالْحَرَامِ مُعَاذُ بْنُ جَبَلْ Why would he tell us all of these ahadith? Why would he send some of his own sahaba in his lifetime to certain parts of the world? Go and teach the people there. Is that person also not a source of knowledge? If this hadith had been, if this hadith had been authentic, what will we say? That if this hadith is authentic, yes, Ali ibn Abi Talib is one of the most learned sahaba, but not the only one. There are many learned sahaba. Unfortunately, oh, fortunately, we are in no need to give this particular understanding to the hadith because it is not even authentic in the first place. Throughout the history of Islam and Muslims, there has always been this undercurrent of persons doing one of two things inventing a hadith about Ali ibn Abi Talib and on the other hand taking certain other hadith out of its context and making something out of it which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam never intended so we will look at some of those statements this was one the hadith is not authentic in the first place had it been authentic it still doesn't harm our position because let's take one thing as a rule to ourselves we don't Fix, become fixated upon one little dot sitting on the wall and forget about the rest. We take things into full perspective. We don't look at one ayah and forget, forget all the other ayah. We don't look at one hadith and forget about all the others. We don't look at one person and forget about all the others. To the Shia it's different. To the Shia, the expected in mo the, the simplest of terms is like this. Because Ali is good, the rest are bad. To us, Ali is good and the rest are good as well. There are several ahadith that speaks about the fadail of Ali, the excellences of Ali, and about the rest of the Sahaba. To the Shia, the approach is simple. 
all the hadith about Ali are automatically go, uh, go the hadith, authentic hadith. And if there is anything narrated by anyone else about Umar and about Uthman and about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhum, that's a lie. Automatically that's a lie. Simply because Ali is so good that no one else can be good along. None of the other Sahaba radiallahu anhum can be good along with him. It is because of ideas such as this that they find themselves forced into a corner at times. How do you then explain the fact that Ali names his sons after these three Khulafa? How do you then explain the fact that Ali is the closest advisor to these three Khulafa? How do you explain the fact that Ali gives his daughter to these three Khulafa? And there is only one answer, and that is Taqiyya. And Taqiyya is no answer, Taqiyya is an insult to the great and noble character of Amir Mu'min Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. So sometimes it is a hadith of this nature where they say that they invent certain things about Ali ibn Abi Talib. There is a Shi'i writer, he's called Ibn Abi al-Hadid. He wrote a sharh of a book called Nahjul Balagha. He's a Shi'i writer, he writes a commentary on Nahjul Balagha. In this book Nahjul Balagha, he says that the first emergence of the phenomenon of hadith forgery was amongst the Shia. They were the first ones to start inventing a hadith about Ali ibn Abi Talib. And then there were others who counted them and they started inventing a hadith on the other side of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. We the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah have no need to look at forged a hadith. Wa ahlu bayt wa itratul Mustafa ma bihi mu hajatun ila fada ila buniyat ala al kalibi. The family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have no need for any kinds of merits which are upon lies. The family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's sufficient for them that within their veins flow the blood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The followers, the, the, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, sufficient for their excellence and virtue is the fact that they were in the company of Al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They stood with him at Badr and Uhud and Hunayn. They stood with him at Khaybar and, and, and Tabuk. Sufficient for them. Anything else? Forgeries do we need to make someone who's already great beyond any kind of perception that we can have? Do we need to make him great by forging certain things about them? We don't need any of that. What Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has stated to us about the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, about the Ahlul Bayt radiallahu anhum, is sufficient to us. We don't need to turn to lies. Then there are certain hadith which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did make about the, 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 uh, about the personality of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. We'll look at a few of those hadith in the time that remains to us which I don't think is very much. But let's just go through a few of them. There are some hadith which are 100% authentic. Some of them which are somewhat disputed whether they are authentic. What is the proper understanding of them? Man kuntu mawlahu fa aliyum mawla. If I am your mawla then Ali is also your mawla. What does Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mean thereby another hadith Anta minni bimanzilati Harun min Musa or Ali you are to me like Harun was to Musa a hadith of this nature what do they mean لَأُعْطِيَنَّ الرَّايَةَ غَدًا رَجُلًا يُحِبُّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ فَأَعْطَى الرَّايَةَ عَلِيًّا Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said during the battle of Khaybar, tomorrow I will give the flag to a man who loves Allah and his Rasul and Allah and his Rasul love him in turn. And then he gave that standard to Ali ibn Abi Talib. These are authentic ahadith. What does Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mean thereby? I've mentioned how many? Three or four? Let's go through them very quickly. Man kuntu mawlahu fa'aliyum mawla. The authenticity of this hadith is somewhat disputed. By and large, it is accepted that uh, as a reliable hadith. There are some versions of which are not reliable, some versions, versions which have uh, some tales added to it. By and large, the hadith, cumulatively seen by looking at all of his various different stands, we can accept this hadith as somewhat possible. But what does Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam mean when he says, "If I'm your mawla, then Ali is your mawla"? We need to quickly go back into history. Um, in the seventh year, after the seventh year. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib south to Yemen. He sent him to Yemen for da'wah and to govern Yemen uh, and to conduct whatever activities had to be conducted over there. While Ali ibn Abi Talib was there, there were certain persons who were not happy with the way that Ali was dealing with things and they were clamoring and murmuring amongst themselves that no, this is not right and that is not right. And they said, we're going to complain to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Baseless accusations against Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali came then in the ninth year to join Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the Hajj. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi came for Hajj in the ninth year. These people try to come to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam during the Hajj to come and complain about Ali. Nabi sallallahu alaihi doesn't listen to any of their complaints. He's very busy with his Hajj. On the way back from Makkah to Medina, he stops at a place. This place is called Ghadir Khum. There's a pond over there. It's called the pond of Khum, Ghadir Khum. There he stops and he's headed up to here with these people complaining about Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And he wants to make it clear that these baseless accusations have no place. Ali is free from any such accusations. And he stands in front of the people and announces to them, What is your attitude towards Ali? If you look at me as your mawla, then you must take Ali as your mawla as well. If you don't have Ali as your mawla, I'm not your mawla. That brings us to the question, so what does Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mean when he says Mawla? As a Shia, he says Master. Mawla is the one who has authority over you. Mawla is the one to whom you must submit yourself. He is your ruler. After uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi is gone, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Ali is your Mawla. If you want an answer to this question, what did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mean and why he had the choice of this word? Don't look anywhere else, look at the Ahlul Bayt radiallahu anhum. Abdullah ibn al-Hasan ibn al-Hasan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib had a son called Hasan. He had a son called Hasan again. And he has a son called Abdullah. He's called Abdullah ibn al-Hasan al-Muthanna. Someone comes to Abdullah ibn al-Hasan and asks him that, Isn't it true that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said about your grandfather Ali that, Man kuntu mawlahu fa'aliyum mawlah? He says, yes, my grandfather said so. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said so about Ali ibn Abi Talib. So he says, so why are people not accepting Ali as their mawla? Why are they not accepting that he alone was supposed to be the Khalifa? Abdullah ibn al-Hasan says, brothers, listen to me. He says, you must know something. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was afsah al-Arab. The most eloquent of the Arabs. If anyone knew the meanings of words, it would have been Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If he wanted to tell people that I'm appointing Ali as my successor, he would have done it in such language that leaves no ambiguity. No one would have any cause to say, but what did he, did he mean? But the fact that he chose words such as Mawla, which has at least ten different meanings. And in this particular context, which meaning is the intended meaning? People were complaining about Ali. They were expressing dislike of Ali. They were expressing hatred of Ali. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is telling them, if you don't have a, an attitude, a benign attitude, one of love and friendship of Ali ibn Abi Talib, then you don't have any such relationship with me. Ali ibn Abi Talib was close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You have a problem with Ali, you have a problem with me. That's what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is telling these people from Yemen who came to complain like this. So Abdullah ibn al-Hassan is telling the person, if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wanted to speak about Khilafah, if you want to speak about who must be the Khalifa, he would have said it in clear terms. The fact that he chose to use ambiguous terms should be reason enough for you to understand that this hadith doesn't mean, it doesn't mean what you think it means. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would have been much more clearer than that. In the tenth year after the Hijrah, the following year after this, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa takes a Sahaba on a campaign. One of the most difficult campaigns ever, Tabuk. For the first time, the Muslims would face an enemy unlike they had ever faced before. Before, who did they face? They faced Quraysh, they faced Ghatafan, they faced a few desert tribes. For the first time, they would square off against an international superpower, the Romans. The time came for Islam to start taking steps outside of the Arabian Peninsula. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa announces to everyone, we are leaving. At what kind of time is he leaving? At a time just before the harvest. And just before the harvest, if your heart is attached to the dunya, you don't want to be in battle, you want to be here. You want to be in Medina to harvest. This was a test of Iman. All the Sahaba radiallahu anhum put down their names, we are all going. Three of them remained behind, thinking that we will catch up later. They eventually did not catch up later, and by setting things out and by uh, putting it back, they eventually, Rasulullah sallallahu came back and they still were not there. Those three, the story is known in the Quran, Allah had forgiven them. But aside from these two groups, the first group that went with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa including Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, all of them went. Sign of Iman. In fact, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu on that day, equipped half of the army from his own wealth. 
at a time when no one had anything. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, who is there to equip this army? Uthman says, Ya Rasulullah, I will equip this army. Half of, it, half of what you need of horses and weapons, from my wealth I will give it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stands up, tears in his eyes, and he says, "Ma darra Uthmana, ma fa'ala ba'da al-yawm." Nothing that Uthman can do after this day will do him harm. So high is the deed that he has done today. And they all go. But Medina needs to be taken care of. All the munafiqeen are staying behind, and three mu'mins who are weak in their iman for that moment, and one other person stays behind. To govern Medina in the absence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is Ali ibn Abi Talib. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ali, you stay behind. This is very difficult because everyone knows that only a munafiq stays behind at a time like this. And Ali is thinking, what are people going to say about me? I've been there for Badr, I've been there for Uhud, I want to be there for this one as well. I don't want people to whisper behind my back that there goes a munafiq. I want to be there with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as I was in the front line everywhere. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam consoles him and tells him, Oh Ali, you are to me like Harun was to Musa. I'm not leaving you behind because I suspect your iman. I'm leaving you behind like Musa left Harun behind to take care of things in my absence. You are to me like Harun was to Musa. If ever it was the intention of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to tell Ali that you are my successor after me, he, wouldn't, he would not have said, you are to me like Harun is to Musa. Because you know what? Harun died before Musa. Harun died and Musa was still alive. If Rasulullah wasallam wanted to say that, I want you to succeed me after I am gone, he would have said, Anta minni bimansirat, yusha min Musa. You are to me like Joshua was to Moses. You are to me like Yusha, because he was the successor. Succession wasn't intended. What was intended was to console the sad heart of Ali. Don't think I'm leaving you behind for the wrong reasons. I'm leaving you behind because you are to me like Harun was to Musa. That's the only reason why I'm leaving you behind. To take care of things while I am gone. A few years prior to that. A few years prior to that, during the battle of Khaybar in the seventh year after the Hijrah. There was... There were several fortresses in Khaybar and the Jews were powerful. That was the economic center of the Jews. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa marched on Khaybar. And there was a certain fortress that was holding out. This fortress was holding out very, very strongly. It wasn't submitting. All the other fortresses were capitulating, this one wasn't. So he took the flag and gave it to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Tell him to take that, attack that fortress. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu comes back at the end of the day he did not achieve victory the second day he gives the flag to Ali to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu he comes back and he did not achieve victory on the third day he takes the flag and he says tomorrow I'm going to give this flag to such a man that Allah and his Rasul love him and he loves Allah and his Rasul then he gave the flag to Ali ibn Abi Talib the context what are people saying what are the Shia saying? They say, you see, giving to Abu Bakr the first day, he didn't succeed. Why not? Because he wasn't man enough. Gave it the second day to Omar. He gave it to him. Why? He wasn't man enough. He is a coward. He cannot even take over one fortress. In fact, there are certain versions of the story that say that when Omar came back the second day, he started telling everyone, don't go to that fort. You can't beat that one. Uh, and he started inspiring people of cowardice you look at the chain of narration of that one there sits a very conspicuous Shia person in the chain of narration he's taken a well known story and changed it slightly to make Omar seem in a bad light all the other stories say that the first time in Abu Bakr went do you think that his stick, or rather victory came on the third day simply Ali went there and blew at the fortress no the attack on the first day weakened the fortress the attack on the second day weakened that fortress even more until eventually victory was achieved at the hands of the third one if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thought that Abu Bakr and Umar were cowards, why would, he, why would he have given them this standard on the first day and say go in the, in, in the first place? 
As for the fact that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that I'm going to give the flag to such a person that Allah loves him, is Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam love him, this was because they were munafiqeen who were whispering. At that time Ali ibn Abi Talib was lying ill, he had illness in his eyes. He couldn't see properly in front of him and he was not there on the battlefield and people were whispering, where's Ali? He's a coward. Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib was the object of malicious rumors from the munafiqeen side but not him alone, everyone else, even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was an object of their malicious rumors. So when people were saying certain things, he was going to make it to them very, very clear. Ali ibn Abi Talib is a man who loves Allah and his Rasul, and Allah and his Rasul love him. So any rumors that people are spreading, forget it. Ali ibn Abi Talib stands most high in the sight of Allah and his Rasul. He is beloved to Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As for Abu Bakr and Umar, where do they stand? We are not people who believe that the merit of the one necessarily reflects badly upon the other. We are not people who, who believe that Ali ibn Abi Talib is good, therefore Abu Bakr, Umar, everyone else is bad. That kind of approach to history is a very, very myopic approach where a person only sees what he wants to see. These few statements that I've mentioned about the fadail of Ali ibn Abi Talib are not the only ones and I haven't, I've barely mentioned anything about the fadail of the rest of the Sahaba. When you think of the fadail of Ali, when people start quoting the fadail of Ali, say, Ala ra'si wal Say, I'm glad on my head and my eyes, Ali ibn Abi Talib is one of the greatest men that history ever knew. But his greatness doesn't mean everyone else is not great. If Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said certain things about him, then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made certain very positive statements about the rest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum too. And when he was on his final deathbed, he would not accept anyone to stand on his musalla except Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's hadith are not only to be seen in isolation, we have to see it as one coherent whole. Everything that's authentic in there. And as for that which is not authentic, whether it refers to Abu Bakr, to Umar, to Uthman, to Ali, to Aisha, Abu Huraira, if it's a forgery, it's a forgery. We don't have any need for forgeries in this deen of ours. There's still much to discuss. Time doesn't leave us. With sufficient t- uh, we don't have sufficient time to go into all of these details. What I want to leave you with now, to sum up everything that we have seen today is that Shiism exists. The branch of Shiism that, pert- that pertains to Imama, it exists upon a, co- uh, upon a complex of manaqib and mathalib. Manaqib means what? The excellence and virtues of one personality and mathalib, the evils of another. Our friend that used to come every week and ask ourselves questions, the one we, the one week when we mentioned just some, not all, just some of the statements which the Shia make, he said those were horrible, horrific statements. Yes, they are horrific statements, but they belong to something which is part and parcel of Shiism. It is all those matalib, those demerits kind of things. There is no Shiism without matalib. There can be no Shiism without saying that Abu Bakr, Umar, and Osman, and all the rest of the Sahaba are bad. Those are things which we cannot wish away. They are there. For as much as we wish to say that there are no differences between the Shia and Ahlul Sunnah, that's wishful thinking is not going to lead to the building of any solid bridges. It's going to be it's going to lead to only one thing, a miraj. And what's the miraj? Hatta ida ja'ahu lam yajid ho shay'an wa wajad Allah indahu fa wafahu hisabahu wallahu sari'u al-hisab. The miraj is such when you stand in front of it, follow it, follow it, when you come in front of it, you find there is nothing. What do you find at, at the end of the miraj? You find Allah at the end of it. And Allah is the one that you'll have to answer to. And Allah is one whose punishment comes very, very quickly, very, very swiftly. So when we start creating these kind of false images, let us not fool ourselves. At the end of the day, we still have to answer to Allah Ta'ala. We still have to tell Allah Ta'ala about why we adopted such terrible attitudes towards the Sahaba. Why we left, why we did nothing when the memories of Abu Bakr, Umar, Aisha, Hafsa was being insulted amongst us, why we left no son. We are, it is our duty, it is our duty to defend the memories of those persons. If it means that we're going to tramp upon the toes of the Shia, then we will tramp upon the toes of the Shia, but we will not allow the memories of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu to be tarnished. That is more important to us than any ill-gotten ideas of unity today. Unity is, but not at the cost of this. 
unit yes if you if you refrain from all of these things by all means we are prepared to go ahead if you refrain from propagation by all means we are prepared to go ahead shelve those things and do it for all the right reasons not the wrong reasons shelve it and then we could perhaps work together we the Ahlul Sunnah will do so in a spirit of tentative tentative agreement you see, yes, it's possible to work with you, but we will always suspect your motives. In our deen, there's no such a thing as taqiyah. In your deen, there's something as taqiyah. You might reject it. That doesn't go for every Shi'i. We have to be on our guard. Wa akhiru da'wana. An alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina Muhammad. Khatam in nabiyyina wa ala alihi. Wa sahbi ajma'in. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. What is said about that is that once someone spat into the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib during a battle and then he did not become angry on account of it and therefore we say about him Karam Allah Wajha Honestly, at this moment, I don't even recall where it is narrated. I will have to go and look at that. My memory fails me at this moment. So, inshallah, at some other occasion. Karam Allah, may Allah honor his face. Um, I think that the reason why it thereafter became a very famous statement is because the Shia made a point of saying, Ali alayhi salam. So Ahlul Sunnah to show from the other side that we have nothing negative to say about Ali ibn Abi They said, Karam Allah wajha. Um, there were those, obviously, the Khawarij in the time of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. Remember, we said that there were two kinds of persons that Rasulullah sallallahu predicted. There will be those who love him to extreme and hate him to the extreme, who will ascribe certain things to them. Actually, he didn't get into that. That was the Khawarij. What did they say about Ali ibn Abi Talib? They said he's a kafir. Na'udhu billah. The Khawarij said that he was a kafir. The Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah in the middle. He is neither a god nor is he a kafir. He is the fourth of the Khulafa or Rashidin. Assalamualaikum. <laughs> You must remember one, one thing about those persons. They had not even seen Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam by that time. These were Yemenis. Ali was sent to Yemen for da'wah. He brought these people into the fold of Islam. They had never seen Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam after that moment in time yet, and they did not know how close was Ali ibn Abi Talib to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They saw certain things and they understood in a particular way. During Hajj they came, they tried to complain. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi did not pay heed to it. When eventually he made it clear to them, the very Sahabi who said, I was the very person who said, I used to complain so much about Ali. When he heard Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying those words, and he recognized who is Ali and what is Ali, he says, from that day on, was Ali became the most beloved of people to me after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This was a new Muslim. Up to that moment in time, he had not even met Rasulullah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam all that he saw was here's our leader he's doing certain things remember this man he just became Muslim he doesn't even know what the Sharia is all about Ali is a learned Sahabi this person does certain things and uh, or rather Ali maybe thought he does certain things this person out of his ignorance he doesn't understand what is right and what is wrong and he wants to come complain to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but the moment he hears the right thing from up there he says if this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying then I accept it as well he loves Ali maybe Talib with all his heart after that Thank <laughs> you.
of the ladies, the cushion of the ladies' side, the cushion of the ladies' side, the chip for me. Can I put the milk first, please? What we actually haven't got into yet, the masalib. Now, uh, you know, the demerits, the negative things that they say about the Sahaba. All that we looked at tonight, kind of introduction, and then we looked at certain instances of Fadail of Ali ibn Abi Talib, some of which are authentic, some of which are not authentic, but we try to contextualize, put it within its context. Then, what's equally important to the Shia is that together with the merits must be the demerits. They must say Ali is the one, uh, the only rightful claimant to Khilafah because he is this and he is that and he is that. And the, what about those who actually did uh, occupy the seat of the Khilafah? They are not worthy of it because, and then the reasons will start coming. It is probably inevitable that we will have to visit some of those things also. As distasteful as it might be, uh, but we need to know what people say about the Sahaba radiallahu anhu and what our responses to all of those things are. So tonight we've only done. Uh, a, a framework of inquiry and then applied it only to the side of the manaqib, the masalib will have to come sometime in future, inshallah. Is it proper to say Sayyidina al Hussein was infallible? Infallibility is the equality that Allah Ta'ala had given to the Anbiya alayhi salam only. And that for a particular reason. If you're going to say Hussein was infallible, why infallibility? What's the proof of that infallibility? It doesn't rest upon any solid kind of evidence. And in the Sharia there is no need for it. As far as we are concerned in Islam, the ascription of infallibility to anyone other than Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is an innovation. It has no place in Islam. Not to Hussein, not to Ali, not to Abu Bakr, not to Umar, not to anyone else for that matter. But I don't think that the, that the message of, of taking away of all this danger she has been coming across so many of the massage, I would say. Because there are still some animals that are still from the you know, different members that are sent to the communities. Why all of a sudden is there now attention to the Shias? In fact, I sat on Sunday with a brother, and this brother, in fact, was very convinced what the Imam said. And the Imam said something to the effect that, you know, why is there all of a sudden attention to the Shias when there are so many other things that we can focus on? I, I think that one of the reasons why this class was established. If we don't have anyone to come, we don't know very much about Shias. They put themselves and go back to the community to spread the danger of Shias. That, unfortunately, to some extent, is not coming across. The check and this will be not in the next There are certain crystallized attitudes towards Shias in our community, we cannot deny that. Amongst the general public, amongst the ulama, amongst the imams as well, there are certain people who have staked their uh, reputations upon the adoption of a certain attitude uh, towards Shiism. It happens to be the case that much of that is not founded upon a very good understanding of Shiism. Uh, it is not an easy thing to tell a learned person that you need to still learn further. And uh, it's not easy for them to admit to their communities either. When they stake their entire reputation and 20 years of service upon a certain... It's not an easy thing to say. It takes something for a person to say that, look, I need to go and learn. If tomorrow someone is offering a class in some other kind of bid'ah which I have no knowledge of, then the fact that I'm sitting on this chair today doesn't mean that I mustn't go and sit at the space where you are sitting tomorrow. But the fact of the matter is... But as it may be, everyone is not going to come. We can only do as much as we can. Um, as for those who have an alternative opinion, if they want, if they wish to continue basing their opinions and attitudes upon the kind of unconvincing grounds that it has been resting upon up to now, we can do we can't do anything about it. But if they are prepared to back it up with some kind of evidence, if they are prepared to back it up with some kind of solid ilm, solid knowledge, then we are prepared to engage it. 
if someone says she is or is not a threat let me know why and I will say why I feel that it is a threat if someone says there are no differences I think we are in a position to demonstrate very ably and very convincingly that there are differences um, mirages are not going to help us wishful thinking is not going to help us but as for those you know, we cannot at the end of the day force everyone to come here those who want to learn will learn those who do not want to learn uh, such is their what shall I call it, their freedom can you choose to be ignorant? perhaps I might not be I, I might be yes though uh, there's a possibility that I might some of the other contrive to be uh, just on one of Farooq's uh, comment but early on had this been anything but Shiism had this been anything but Shiism no one would have had a problem had we been sitting and talking about Baha'is and Qadianis no one would have had a problem but Shiism gets special treatment you can touch on anyone but don't touch the Shia that seems to be the case right now otherwise why? back then in the 80s when we were fighting the Qadiani case many of us were perhaps some of us weren't even born yet but those that might remember who are saying but no all of us were united you know why? because the Qadianis don't have a state of their own they don't have an Islamic Republic they're just a group that uh, lives here and lives there and they have a, a few uh, amount of innovated ideas and so on when it comes to the Shia everyone, not everyone uh, some of us become oversensitive and why are they speaking about the Shia? no, we have to speak about the Shia like we have to speak about everything else we have to speak about the Shia because we are the Ahlul Sunnah for the same reason we have to speak about the Baha'is for the same reason you're going to have to speak about the Qadianis for the same reason we have to speak about everything else these are threats that exist within our community we have to take them up and we have to deal with them. We have all of you some numbers which should have a strong number. So whatever happens, we will see you and you issue this inshallah. We will charge for that message. This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. Mm -hmm.